We're going to turn to God's Word, pick up our series in Revelation. The, the last time we were, were in the book, we we're in Revelation chapter 6, and we saw these four horses that, were, that had freedom to ride back and forth along the earth, that, um, that they'd been allowed to, to Rome, and we'd seen how that, that, that white horse was like um, earthly kingship, where, where they'd just, just gone wrong, just trying to conquer other nations, and, um, and therefore bringing all kind of woes with it. And so this next section, as we move from the back end of chapter 6 into chapter 7, it's, it's now recognizing that within the context of suffering, chapter 6, these seven seals of chapter 6 are really depicting the suffering that takes place in a fallen world in this life. It points to the fact that a day is coming, but that in this life, these four horses will be with us. Now, as we move into chapter 7, the focus is still the same kind of focus, but it's saying, what is it going to mean for the church in the context of that suffering? Is, is the church immune to it? Is the church protected? What does it mean to the church in the context of these four horses? So that's where the vision is going. So if you've got your Bible, Turn with me into Revelation chapter 6, and I'll read from verse 9. <clears throat> so this is picking up on the, the four horses of the first four seals on this scroll, and then from, from seal 5 onwards, we're moving into the people of God. When he opened <clears throat> the fifth seal, I saw under the altar <clears throat> the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, <clears throat> How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. <clears throat> then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to earth as late, as fig, as late, fig tree, as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Just to say, see, the sixth seal here is the day of the return of Jesus. Everything up to the sixth seal is what happens in this life. Then the sixth seal is the day of Jesus' return. That's what we've just read. <laughs> and it matches up with Matthew chapter 24. Okay, so now we move to the focus of the people of God. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. 
From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. And from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. We give thanks to God for his amazing word. I don't know if you play chess. I used to um, play chess a lot with my brother growing up and the reality was whenever my, me and my brother whether it was table tennis whether it was football whether it was cricket whether it was chess whether it was snap whatever it was it was full out war we were quite competitive my brother and I do I don't know if you relate to it so so I remember during holiday times during the summer holidays during those endless days of summer me and my brother would sometimes get the chessboard out. Do you know what I mean? And, and it, was, it was bigger than Kasparov and Karpov. It was just like, it was totally focused warfare. You'd make a mistake, you'd, you'd lose your queen and it would just all kick off in the, the living room. Do you know, I, I, I remember it, there, there are three ways basically, aren't there, as to the way that a chess game finishes. First of all, someone gets checkmate. The joy in my heart when I used to topple Steve's king, do you know what I mean? Was, and then just run around the living room going, la, loser, do you know what I mean? It was just, was brilliant way to spend your summer holiday. But um, so, so actually, checkmate is a brilliant vibe. It's a great feeling. Sometimes it ends in a draw after 500 moves of trying to trap the king and then failing and then being called for tea. You just have to call it quits. That, that was totally unsatisfactory. The draw was the worst outcome. But then occasionally it got so competitive with my brother and I that one of us would lose a key piece. And, and then in a fit of anger, one of us would knock the board over. If I can't win, you can't win. And then it would just be total carnage. Do you know, as I, as I was... Um, thinking about this passage and I was thinking about chess, I, I was researching the longest games of chess ever played. Apparently they are measured by the number of moves, but I was also interested by the length of time. So I thought just, I'd, I'd ask you this question, what do you think is the longest game of chess in history? What do you think might be the longest games of chess? How many moves do you reckon and how many hours? They actually measure it by moves, not hours, but you can have a go at both. Just have a little prediction. Turn to the person next to you. What do you think the longest game of chess has ever been? Do you like playing chess? Okay, I'm not going to dwell on this too long, but um, uh, anybody want to guess the number of moves? What, what kind of number of moves? Jerry? 1,200. 1,200 moves. That's, uh, that's a starting point, isn't it? It's 1,200 moves. Anybody else want to offer the number of moves? 3,000. 
3,000. Anybody else with it? Anybody else got any ideas how many moves? I'll, I might take one more guess. Come on. Come on. <laughs> well, Reverend Baker, thank you for your contribution this morning. I think you're going to be very disappointed when I give you the figures now, actually. So um, the top four longest rated chess games ever played was, um, first of all, Ivan Nikolic versus Goran Arsevic was... <laughs> I think it's real, um, was 269 moves. So, uh, you, I'm sorry, I was just, just I picked a number. <laughs> 269 moves. Apparently it took 20 hours. Okay, 20 hours. It ended in a draw. Like how ridiculous, how ridiculous. Um, the, the longest game that actually finished in a win was between Alexandre Danin and Sergei Azarov, which was 239 moves. Um, I think Danin needed the win so that he could equalize in the Czech League. That's how deep my research went on this. Lauren Fresinet and Alexandra Kostinuek, um, that was 237 moves. But what was interesting about that game was that the 116 of those moves were as part of the end game. There are some tricky moments where you get down to one player's got two pieces and, you know, just the king and, you know, trying to get the king out of the way. It just went on and on for 114 moves. And then Viktor Korchnoi and Anatoly Karpov, that was 124 moves. The game could have gone on longer, but unfortunately, <coughs> Korchnoi's 124th move produced a stalemate. So that was it. Could, no can do, game over. Do you know, the cry, you might be thinking, why am I going on about this? The cry of Revelation chapter 6 is, how long? How long? And it comes, this cry, how long, comes from the souls of those who had been slain. It comes from those who had held on to the word of God and who had testified to Jesus. Look at verse 10 of chapter 6. This is the cry of the martyrs. It's the cry of the saints who have been suffering for Jesus. They cry out, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. In other words, the cry of the church in the midst of the suffering in Revelation is how long must we suffer? How long must we endure injustice? And the answer, which probably feels quite unsatisfactory in the vision, is in verse 11. The answer that comes back is this they were told to wait a little longer. You're kidding me. You're kidding me. They were told to wait a little longer. It's not an easy response to sit with. We don't like waiting, do we? Does anyone like waiting? Especially if we are suffering. If you are suffering, having to wait a little longer is awful. Why doesn't God just simply kick the chessboard over and leave it at that. Why does God take such a long time? Isn't it time for him to step in, to send in the tanks, and to sort everything out? How long, O oh sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you sort this mess out? You know, the key point, that is going to shine through in this vision and already is shining through this vision. The key point, and if you don't take hold of anything else this morning, do take hold of this. The key point of Revelation is that God is in control. God is in control. God is seated on the throne. 
Just because something takes a long time doesn't mean that God has settled for the draw. Not ever will he do that. The lamb is seated on the throne. Jesus has the victory. Jesus goes all out for the win. You see, even though the four horses here ride back and forth, causing great devastation, even though the church and the people of God are not immune to this suffering, God is in control of the board. And I think that that's such an important message for us to take hold of. It speaks into our world events when we see the chaos, when we see the lawlessness, when we see the destruction, when we just see the plain evil, when we see injustice and suffering and poverty, when we see the whole gamut of the four horses, there can be this sense of despair. And we resonate with this cry, how long? But the truth is, God is in control. How can I say that with confidence? How can I say today from here with assurance? How can I assure you today that God is in control? Well, I want you to look at the four angels. I want you to look at the four angels. Chapter 7, verse 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. I've talked about these four horses that are released through the fall and causing devastation. But let us not just focus on the four horses. I want us to see the four angels. Basically, in a nutshell, the four angels that are posted on the four corners of the world are preventing total wipeout. They are preventing. God has placed these angels at the four corners as a symbol to say, look, there is a boundary. There is a boundary that whatever chaos is going on in the world, there is a boundary. It's as if God is saying, thus far and no farther. It's like a boxing ring. It's like the four angels are the four corners of a boxing ring. And whatever battle is going on in the ring, there is this secure boundary that God is in control. If the angels weren't there, it would spill out into oblivion but God is in control he is containing this stuff and he is playing a long game I think of it like a, a boxing ring I remember years ago at spring harvest someone sharing a picture from God and it was someone had this picture of a boxing ring and there was two fighters in the ring one was Jesus and one was Satan and in the fight Jesus has landed the killer punch and Satan was on the canvas he was, he was not able to get up. There was no way back. Satan was flawed on the canvas, but he was still shouting out. But what was crucial was that the referee was counting. Seven, eight, nine. You know, there is no way back for the enemy. The cross and the resurrection was the killer blow for the enemy. There was no coming back from the knockout blow of Calvary. That's where the enemy, that's where all the suffering, it had to be dealt with at the cross and it could only be dealt with at the cross. It could only be dealt with by Jesus. It was the only, only way. And so, and so, and so whatever chaos is going on the ring whatever satan will seek to do as the referee is calling out time whatever satan is seeking to do there is no way back for the enemy and there is this boundary so this is what's going on in the vision four horsemen are riding 
but four angels are marking God's boundaries. I hope you find that helpful to think that this is not outside of the control of God, but it's always con- it's contained within his boundary markers. But what about the church? You see, at the heart of Revelation, it's a letter, and it continues to be a letter to the people of God. And we always have to come back. When we're trying to understand Revelation, it's really helpful to come back to the reality that this vision was given to a suffering, persecuted church who was suffering the effects of the four horses within the context of the Roman Empire. And the church there were crying out, how long? How long, Jesus, before you return? What, why is all this bad stuff happening? Surely, surely you have the victory. They were asking a lot of questions. <clears throat> and the question here that Jesus, this vision deals with at this moment in time is what about the church? You see, in the ring, in the battle, in the midst of the four horses, the truth is God's people are not immune to suffering. We are playing out this cosmic battle in the ring. We are, we are, we are inside the four corners. We are inside the four corners. In fact, actually, we hear the cry of the martyrs here. How long, Lord? How long? How long do we have to face this battle? How long? And so, just in these moments, <clears throat> I just want to ask the question, what is the response? It's a valid question, isn't it? How long? And it's a natural question. It's the question that was in the forefront of the mind of the church in Asia Minor. It's the forefront of the church in so many places in this world today. What is the response of God to this valid how long questions? There's two encouragements in chapter 7 that I just want to highlight and I want you to take away with this morning. The first encouragement is this. What we see in chapter 7 is that the people of God, yes, they are suffering, but they are sealed. Verse 3 of chapter 7. Um, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. God, we see in the midst of the chaos in the ring, he has put a seal on his people. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 that you see here on the screen It says, you were sealed in him with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are echoes here of the children in Egypt. Just, do you remember when Pharaoh was breathing his worst? And the children of Israel are camped by the Red Sea. What was the instruction to the children of Israel to protect their children from the angel of death? What was the the instruction at Passover? It was sacrifice the lamb and with the blood paint it on the doorposts and that will be, the blood will be the protection over your household paint the doorpost with the blood of the lamb. Now, when Jesus died and was the ultimate Passover lamb, he shed his blood for you and me. And by that blood and through the gift of the Holy Spirit, we are sealed. We are sealed. Now, that doesn't mean to say that the angel of death isn't going to come. It doesn't mean to say that we don't have to wander in the desert for 40 years. It doesn't mean to say that we don't have to go through wilderness times. None of this sealing means that we don't have to suffer. Don't, it's not like we're, it doesn't put us in a protective bubble. 
He marks us with his Holy Spirit. He seals us. And what that says, what that says is that I will lead you through. I will lead you through. Take the encouragement as I led the children of Israel through the desert to the promised land. I will lead my people through this life to their heavenly rest. By the blood of the Lamb and the power of the Holy Spirit, you are sealed. You are sealed. The Lord will lead us safely through. There is a whole load of speculation around this number, 144,000. Does that mean that we're kind of on like on a Duolingo league table that we've got to be in the Diamond League or something like that to, to get through? Not at all. Not at all. What is, what is going on here is a head count. It's a symbolic number. It's a census. The 144,000 is a census. Actually, when you look... Um, in verse 9, he says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one can count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. What we're actually seeing is the actual number <clears throat> is so vast, it's too much to count. The, the 144,000 is a symbol. What that says is, Jesus says, I have put a seal on the forehead of all my people, and I know the head count. That's what he's saying. It simply is that. We don't need to overcomplicate it. It's like Christ knows his people. In fact, he doesn't just know the head count. He knows how many hairs are on our head. That's the detail of his knowledge. Do you know what I mean? In other words, no one is going to go missing on the journey. No one is going to, I'm not going to lose anyone. I am a shepherd. I will lead my people. I'm not going to lose any sheep on the way home. I know the number. Don't fret. I haven't forgotten you. You are sealed. So the first part of this how long question, the first response is, Yes, you are suffering, but don't worry. You have the seal of the Holy Spirit. You have the seal of the Holy Spirit upon you. you are, you're, you're in the book that you're written in the, the Lamb's book. You're there. You're, you know, you're part of the census. Yes, you've still got a journey before you get home. Yes, you're not in a protected bubble, but you are sealed. The Holy Spirit is a deposit that guarantees that which is to come. Amen? It's good. So that's the first point. That's the first part of the answer. The second part is, yes, the people of God are suffering, but they're also serving. They're also serving. This is more into deep into chapter 7. Verse 9, after, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. I think the location of this vision is, is equally important here. The, the vision is in the throne room of heaven, but what emerges in this chapter is that the throne room of heaven is actually the temple of God. Look at verse 15. This is the people of God. It says, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Now, this is a picture of service. Not only are the people of God sealed, but actually they are called to serve. In, without going too complicated, in the sequence of the vision, we haven't yet reached the new Jerusalem. We haven't yet encountered the new heavens and the new earth. That's further to come. We've not yet reached home. We're not there yet. Actually, you've got to keep in mind that this chapter is a picture for the suffering church in the middle of the context of the four horses and the four angels. And so the, the symbolism is, is clear. Yes, you are suffering, 
But in the midst of that suffering, I want you to serve day and night as a kingdom of priests. Don't just be on the defensive. I want you to serve. We are servants of the living God. What did Jesus say? I have not come to be served, but to serve. And as we serve those around us, as we reach out to those in need, as we serve the lost, the broken, the the wounded, as we reach out to those who are suffering, as we serve those who've not got a coat or clothes, as we serve those who are in prison, as we serve those without water, without food, without shelter, as we serve even in the midst of our own suffering, it's as if we are serving Jesus. It's as if we are in the temple of God, day and night, serving. Our service has a sweet aroma. It is pleasing to the Lord as we pour out ourselves as a drink offering to those around us. It is as if we are serving the Lord himself. Isn't this the way of Jesus? Isn't this his pilgrimage that we follow in his footsteps? And so... In the mid, what I'm trying to say in this part of the answer is this. In the midst, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the four horses and all the devastation, yes, we will suffer because we see that Jesus suffered. But in the midst of that suffering, we are called to serve. That's our calling. That's our journey. That's our pilgrimage. Yes, we will suffer, but we are called to serve. The question that God answers the how long question with a different question. The response of God is, who are you called to serve? Who are you called to serve? So there we have it. The cry of Revelation chapter 6 is how long? Why don't you just kick over the chessboard, God? Why don't you bring it to an end? And so what is the response of God to this valid question? And this is what he says. Yes, you are going to suffer. He says this to his church. Yes, you will suffer, but take heart, you are sealed. Yes, you will suffer, but you are called to serve. That's not easy, is it? It's not comfortable. (laughs) But it's real, isn't it? It's absolutely real. And as I finished writing this sermon, (laughs) the song that came into my mind and my heart, and I started singing where I was, so let us learn how to serve. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now to be his offering. I can't remember all the words, but it was the song that was on my heart. That whole idea. So let us learn how to serve. Yes, we'll suffer, but we're sealed. Yes, we will suffer. But who is God calling us to serve? Let's pray together. Let's pray.